Bank failures expose economic concerns, and Ukraine exposes GOP divisions. A week of whiplash on Wall Street after two U.S. banks collapse and the government takes extraordinary efforts to prevent further financial turmoil. Americans can rest assured that our banking system is safe. Your deposits are safe. The administration tries to calm concerns with all eyes on a key Federal Reserve meeting next week. Plus... Was it intentional or not? Uh, don't know yet. We know that the aggressive behavior was intentional. Tensions between the U.S. and Russia reach a new high after a Russian jet takes down a U.S. drone, the first direct conflict between the two nations since Moscow's invasion of Ukraine a year ago. The war going on in Ukraine right now is not a territorial dispute. Prominent Republicans criticize a likely 2024 presidential contender from their own party for downplaying Russia's invasion. Next. This is Washington Week. Corporate funding is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular's goal has been to provide wireless service that helps people communicate and connect. We offer a variety of no-contract plans, and our U.S.-based customer service team can help find one that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by... Ku and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. I'm William Brangham. Financial shockwaves rippled across the country this week, following two of the biggest bank failures in American history. Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank were shut down by regulators last weekend. On Monday, President Biden, trying to prevent more failures, took the unusual step of promising that all depositors at those collapsed banks would be made whole. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen also addressed the banking concerns this week when she testified before Congress. Our banking system is sound. Americans can feel confident that their deposits will be there when they need them. But fears do remain. On Thursday, some of the nation's biggest lenders gave $30 billion to a smaller rival, First Republic Bank, trying to assure its survival. Here in Washington, lawmakers on both sides of the aisle want to know what went wrong and why bank management and their regulators were caught so flat-footed especially following the 2008 financial crisis. We need to learn from what has just happened with these banks and go forward by tightening the regulations. I think it'd be premature to start talking about solutions before we fully define the problem and, uh, and ultimately get answers from the regulators about why they were asleep at the job. So this economic unease, coupled with ongoing concerns about inflation, raised the stakes for a highly anticipated Federal Reserve meeting next week, where Chairman Jerome Powell is expected to announce the Fed's next move on interest rates. Joining me now to discuss all of this and more is Neil Irwin. He's the chief economic correspondent for Axios. And here with me in the studio, Finn Gomez is the political director for CBS News. Zolan Kano Youngs covers the White House for The New York Times. And Kyla Toshi, she is an anchor and senior White House correspondent for CNBC. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so much for being here. Feeling bad I didn't wear green like everybody else did. <laughs> um, uh, Kyla, to you first. This week we saw two banks collapse, this very aggressive move by the federal government. We saw this injection of billions of dollars into another lender. All of this to calm the jitters, but the jitters do not seem to be calmed. Is it your sense that we are through the worst of this yet? I think there's still a lot more to learn because we know what the government and what the private sector has done so far and what they have disclosed. But we got a very important data point this week from the Federal Reserve on Thursday, which is what its balance sheet looks like. How much money has the Fed had to give out to other undisclosed banks? That number was $153 billion. That's the highest on record, even higher than any single time during the global financial crisis back in 2008. So that tells you that there are a lot of banks we don't know about who have run to the 
the arms of the Fed for low-cost capital because they're worried about their own companies. We won't know who those banks are for another two years. And even for the deal that 11 major U.S. banks did for First Republic, where they essentially handed over $30 billion in deposits, they only did that Opened for up $30 billion in, in checking accounts. Well, some might say they just transferred back $30 billion in deposits. The First Republic customers had very worriedly moved right. to their banks. And so it was just, you know, it was a returned gift, so to speak. But that deal only lasts for about 120 days. We could see what happens to First Republic. Can it find a buyer? Is the bank's operation even worse after that time? Or is this situation over? Does the tide come back in? We still don't know. And there's a lot we're waiting to learn. Um, Neil Irwin, to you on this question, um, there has been some second guessing about this aggressive move that the administration and the Fed took to, to try to stop the bleeding here. Uh, what do you think? Was this, did it seem appropriate to the moment? Look, this time a week ago, they saw a profound risk of a systemic crisis of a uh, run on deposits at, uh, at, at nations, at banks around the nation. Um, they decided it was better to, to do too much than too little in that situation, and that uh, it was worth it to kind of take the risk off the table that your deposits Oh, even over the federal limit of $250,000 might be at risk. Uh, look, there's going to be a lot of picking over whether it was the right thing to do, whether, you know, what the long-term costs are, how the long-term regulatory structure ought to change as a result. Uh, but the, the judgment that I think is not, not at all crazy and quite reasonable is that uh, if we get in a real financial crisis where every bank is seeing mass withdrawals, that's a very bad situation to be in, would be very devastating for the U.S. economy going forward. Indeed. Uh, Zolan, can I ask you, what is the White House's view of all of this? Do they think that their actions, certainly the, the, the president is out there championing it, saying, we got you covered, we're going to make sure this doesn't get worse. Do they think secretly behind closed doors that, that the worst is over? Well, I mean, the president is out there saying that, but also emphasizing at this time accountability for banking executives. I think that definitely they feel that the actions this week were necessary, but to say that there's no anxiety both politically and for the actual issue here we're talking about with the financial sector, I, I, I would I, I don't think we could say that. Look, politically, we have to, under, to understand the concern here. I think we have to take a step back and realize how this, this president has, uh, what image he has projected over these past two years. One of the champion of the middle class, um, how many events have we seen recently where he's going and talking in front of unions as well, talking about bolstering the manufacturing industry? He often talks about the sanctity of labor as well. Um, now you also have that same president that was in his West Wing office watching what happened in 2008 when, uh, when a bailout happened in, and it was met with backlash as well. That still haunts Washington today. So uh, absolutely there's concern. I think you can still say two things can be true. I think they still are comfortable with the actions taken this week. But at the same time, politically as well, going forward, there is concern in the administration. Yeah. Finn, Zolan used the B word, and that is not the B word that the administration has been willing to say, that this was a quote unquote bailout. Mm -hmm. Can you remind us why that is such a sensitive issue for this White House and particularly for this president? Well, you use the word jitter, uh, jitters, and I think that's exactly what uh, that that word that's concerned that that word would cause, I think, among the American public within the administration if they utilize that word. It harkens back to that 2008 global uh, uh, global crisis that, that happened that, that is still has has that impact, that still has permeated throughout the political landscape. Now, you're seeing it used rhetorically by uh, Republicans, especially from the Senate side, but it's also being used by uh, uh, potential Republican presidential hopefuls, by presidential candidates that who are saying that this is, in fact, a better out. And I think it also could be a prelude to what may come as we continue forward into this presidential cycle. There's also a question here, too. I mean, remember what the, one of the political vulnerabilities uh, was for this president. Even before this, it was also inflation for the past two years. Right. And how will the Fed's actions going forward impact how they're trying to tame the, uh, a red-hot economy, try to tame inflation as well? How will this impact a decision in the weeks to come around raising interest rates? All of that also factors into sort of the concern and anxiety about the actions But taken. there's a very real risk that the Fed continues to send mixed messages because last weekend when they came to the rescue of Silicon Valley Bank and they took control of Signature Bank, they did so under 
um, you know, and under the the rationale that there was a systemic risk to the right, economy. This was so an emergency. At the same time, they're, they're trying to shore up confidence. They're saying this could spill over. Right. And so it's a double edged sword. And they run the risk of doing the same thing next week with their interest rate decision because they have said inflation is persistent. It run the risk, runs the risk of getting entrenched. We cannot stop now. If they stop, they're signaling to the markets and the economy and the broader American public that they're worried. That's like your parents getting worried and, <laughs> and you as a kid saying, oh, no, I, I wasn't scared until yeah. I saw you get scared. If mom looks scared. Uh-oh, watch yeah. out. Exactly. Uh, Neil Irwin, um, several Democrats, including um, Senator Elizabeth Warren, have argued that the 2018 rollbacks of some of the Dodd-Frank reforms that were put in place after the 08 crisis, that those rollbacks were complicit in what went down this week. What is the evidence for that? So, look, in a narrow sense, I think the evidence is ambiguous that if those uh, legal changes to the regulatory structure in 2018 hadn't happened, would we have avoided all of this? That said, that the tone that has uh, that enveloped Washington over bank regulation the last few years, it's unquestionable that it was in the direction of these mid-sized banks do not deserve the kind of scrutiny that the giant banks get. And so what that law that you're re referencing uh, did was said, you know, banks that are have 200 billion, $240 billion in assets, they don't need to be treated the way a JP Morgan, a Citibank does. And so we're going to, to lower the level of scrutiny. And apart, again, from the, the specific question of whether, if that law hadn't been passed, whether Silicon Valley Bank would still be, uh, you know, operating, <laughs> uh, I think the, the open question is, well, was there a broader situation where regulators felt like they could not push hard and not really scrutinize and drop the hammer on banks that were taking inappropriate risks in the last couple of years? Um, Finn, the, the, we heard from Thune and from Elizabeth Warren at the top of the show uh, two competing ideas of what Congress ought to or ought not do in response to this. What is your sense about, does Congress have a mandate? Does there enough of a majority of people in the, in the House and the Senate to say, we need to act, and, and if so, what is it that they might do? I think it depends on how, how, how worse this crisis gets. I think it, 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 there is a, a, a sort of this, this collective field of, of, of populism right now, and I think that this plays into that, and I think it, it affects both parties politically. And if this, this crisis gets larger, if, there's, if it gets bigger and has more of an impact like across the country, I, I think you could see some maneuvering on both sides to do something more, maybe perhaps doing something for what, uh, what the president called for today and, and having more punitive measures for some of these senior exec executives who, who have run these banks, who've, who've, who've led, who have who've led, who who led in these banks into these into the crisis that we're seeing now, William. Uh, Zolan, this is this point we've been making here is as you were saying before, the president does want to seem like a middle class champion, and the, this concern over calling this a bailout, and yet also wanting to keep the economy in moving in the right direction. Um, it, it, it's an incredibly complicated circumstance for him. It seems like he does. Uh, in, in some ways could be caught between a very real rock and a hard place here. You know, I, I, I think that's true. And, um, you know, talking about some of the progressive backlash on the Hill, one thing that I thought was interesting is, uh, and I saw a couple members connected also immediately saying, look, these executives may have traded stocks, may have, may, may, may have made a profit, but at the same time, Republicans continue to block a student loan plan that I'm sure that the president would love to be galvanizing his base off right now in the courts. So now you also right. have that happening right now and that pressure on the White House, too. It's an incredibly uh, complicated balance that he has. I think it will probably factor into more of the events we've seen of him touting an infrastructure package, touting a, t a chips package as well. Um, if we see in the weeks ahead or in the months ahead um, what many expect will be a potential re-election announcement, I think that you probably will see the administration double down on some of those events. Um, last summer, we did see a series of legislative achievements happen, and you would think that they would point to that to counter some of the criticism that might come from the past two weeks. Right. I'm sure they wish that this banking crisis would simply go away and they could talk about the record, as you're saying. And, and remember, that record, a lot of those, a lot of those benefits, it takes time for voters right. to feel. It's not instant. That's right. This, however, people see, 
people talk about immediately, people can feel immediately as well. William, I think you're also going to see the administration trying to lean on the private sector very heavily. Earlier this week, the Treasury and the Fed brokered a deal with the four largest banks in the country. They had the four largest bank CEOs with them in person. And the message that that sends is, we bailed you out 15 years ago. You're a lot stronger. You bail them out now. You, you bail out your peers. Right. They want to wash their hands of this. They've done what they feel like they can do. And now they want to lean on someone else to do it. Uh, Neil, Neil Irwin, one last question to you on this. Um, as Kayla was mentioning before, the Federal Reserve is meeting next week. A lot of pressure on them. They want to keep moving forward against inflation, but what they do next week could certainly be a signal as to what they really think about the severity of the crisis that we are in now. What do you expect from that meeting? So the Fed likes to emphasize the idea of different tools for different tasks, meaning they raise interest rates to try and fight inflation. Meanwhile, they do all this emergency bank lending to try and prevent a financial crisis, prevent the banks from uh, from collapsing. Uh, in truth, those things are more intertwined than they really like to admit. And you know, uh, if they if they do raise rates next week, that's going to make things harder on banks. And if they back off, that might uh, make the inflation situation harder. So it's a really no-win situation. Um, I think they're probably going to go forward with that rate hike, but signal openness and flexibility and, and that they might not do it again uh, if, if things really do go south. Because the truth is, if this banking problem that happened over the last week spreads to the entire banking system, results in credit contraction, banks making less loans, making more stringent loans, that will cause an economic slowdown in a way that the Fed interest rate increases up to this point really haven't. So there is a possibility that we will see the disinflation, the economic slowdown they've been trying to engineer for a year now uh, come about because of this banking slowdown. But the range of uncertainty is enormous at this particular moment. All right, Neil Irwin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, turning overseas now, tensions between the U.S. and Russia is on the rise after a Russian fighter jet intentionally engaged with a U.S. drone over the Black Sea on Tuesday. It was the most direct confrontation between the two powers since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And it comes days after Florida's governor and likely 2024 Republican presidential contender Ron DeSantis drew sharp criticism from several of his fellow Republicans for minimizing the significance of that invasion. He told Fox News, quote, while the U.S. has many vital national interests, becoming further entangled in a territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. So, remarkable set of events that we've been seeing here. Um, uh, Zolan, to you first. On this issue of this, this drone that we have seen, this is the kind of event that the White House seems that they have been trying all along to not allow happen, a direct kinetic conflict between Russia and the United States. How, how has the White House been responding to this? You're absolutely right. How often have we heard the president uh, emphasize to the American public, to the world, I'm not sending American troops actually into this into this war zone. Um, we are supporting Ukraine with foreign aid. We are. Uh, I'm trying to unite uh, uh, the West against Russia to have economic pressure, um, but we are trying to avoid any type, as you said, a kinetic war. Um, it's been an absolute focus for this administration, and this kind of direct. I mean, uh, the public out there might be thinking, "Well, wait, this is a drone." I mean, is that still the same? I mean, no, it's not. Not the same, obviously, as, as saying troops in, but this still is the type of escalation that they have been trying to avoid here. Um, also, there's a couple other concerns now that this has happened. One, that video only shows, according to U.S. officials, just a little bit of, of what actually happened here. Um, the administration's account is that there were two Russian fighter jets and maybe 19 passovers over this drone as well. So that just captures one. Um, they, as you said, have said that at least the dumping of that jet fuel um, was likely deliberate as well. Also, what happens going forward in terms of that drone that they say may be deep in the sea? They, they it's not clear yet whether or not Russia is actually going to recover it. They say it's unlikely, but also there's concern about whether or not that could be used for propaganda purposes. U.S. officials are saying, however, that's incredibly unlikely at this time. Kyla, the, just the fact that we saw that video even seems quite striking. I mean, how quickly that was declassified and put out there. Well, I think the administration has realized that this strategy of radical declassification has been successful since the very start of this invasion. They had hoped that by telling the world what Russia was planning, that it would deter an invasion. And even though it didn't, it showed that the U.S., uh, at least its intelligence, was right after the chaotic withdrawal from Afghanistan when the intelligence there was highly flawed. Um, so 
the ability to continue declassifying this to show the world in a very public way that this is exactly what happened and let the viewers take for themselves. But I think what is so important about the timing of this is that it comes just before President Xi is set to visit with Vladimir Putin in Moscow. And that axis has been strengthening, and Vladimir Putin is emboldened by having an ally like that. And this is pure saber rattling before that meeting where he is going to get to put all of his own pictures out there um, with these two massive superpowers in the East um, and, and show the U.S. that he has this friend on his side. So certainly he is operating as if he is above the law. That is how he's been operating since the beginning of this conflict. And um, I don't think that the administration is surprised by it, even though, of course, it, it was its goal to not have this happen in the first place. Um, uh, Finn, I want to turn to you on this question of what DeSantis said about sure. Ukraine. Referring to the illegal invasion of Ukraine as a quote-unquote territorial dispute struck, you know, got him a, a barrage of criticism. But you've been out on the campaign trail. You've been at a Trump rally recently talking with Republican voters. We all think that Ron DeSantis is going to get into this race. And so the question is, does the position that he is staking out on Ukraine, that it really is not for us, let's not waste American blood and soil over there, um, is that a resonant point with Republican voters? Absolutely. And specifically with that MAGA base that both he and uh, Donald Trump are uh, you know, trying to appeal to. And I think when I spoke to voters in Davenport, Iowa, uh, to them, this was uh, the, the position that he and Donald Trump are aligned on is one that they firmly support. When Donald Trump was speaking about this issue and saying that he was going to end this war on day one, there was the loudest applause, one of the loudest applause uh, reactions from the crowd uh, to this issue. He is playing to that MAGA base. He is playing. He, and, and, you know, even though he has not jumped into the race, as you mentioned, William, he it does. He does seem like a candidate, and he does seem like someone who's preparing for a, to jump into this presidential race. And he's in that issue is is one that's leading him and, and connecting him to that base. I mean, Zolan, I should point out there are a lot of other Republicans who jumped to this to to criticize DeSantis and say that is not what America's position ought to be, but. You know, Kevin McCarthy, before he became speaker, hinted at this as a possibility as well, that there will not be an open checkbook. Where do you see this coming down? Do you think the Republican Party will embrace that idea? I do think after the or part of the Trump effect and one of the lasting sort of effects of the Trump administration is a uh, sort of realization that the MAGA base, as you were saying, uh, there is interest in moving away from this sort of interventionist kind of approach to a more sort of isolationist, quote unquote, America first approach. That being said, there were Republicans on the Hill that were criticizing Ron DeSantis this week, and I found that they were criticizing that specific term, territorial dispute. And something that came up in conversations I was having, particularly with foreign policy experts in this area, was if you are likely to run for higher office and you are put in a position where this war is still ongoing, and Yes, maybe you aren't advocating for as much aid, but you're now in a completely different position where you are probably going to be in a position where you're rallying for some. You That comment lives on. And if there are members of Congress on the Hill that don't want to send foreign aid at that point, think about how much harder it's now become. You've now belittled this war, this invasion, to something like a territorial dispute. Um, that's going to make it harder going forward, not just for some uh, potential candidate that wants higher office, but also, look, the president right now is in a position where, of course, he has made clear that he wants to maintain support for Ukraine. That is absolutely true. He is also has the challenge of European allies dealing with an energy crisis and an American public that continues to deal with economic pressure, as we've been saying. So comments like this out in the public add to that challenge of maintaining the support of the country for this aid as well as your allies. But there were also a few Republicans that I spoke with who said, I didn't see those comments, so I couldn't possibly <laughs> right. respond, which is another relic from the Trump era, the plausible deniability. Mm. Um, so I think we're going to be seeing a lot of that as this schism continues in the party. Do you think, though, that this moves into becoming a legitimate issue in the 2024 presidential race? At least a legitimate talking point. But, you know, a lot of Republicans will say actions speak louder than words. There's one thing that they're saying out, out on, on, on the campaign trail. But then Kevin McCarthy even assured his allies privately that he would continue that support to keep it, flowing. It may help, though, with 
starting to create some factions on the campaign trail as well with these candidates. You already saw with Nikki Haley's campaign launch focusing on foreign, well, focusing more so on foreign policy than I've heard from some of the other people in the race. You heard Mike Pence immediately react to this as well as we played. Meanwhile, you have DeSantis and Trump that are sort of playing for that same base as well. So you are starting to see, um, and again, DeSantis has not announced a, an, uh, an actual campaign yet, but you are starting to see some factions with, with these potential candidates. Absolutely. And you are seeing that space in the lane opposing that position by both Trump and DeSantis. Mike Pence, as you mentioned, yeah. he, he spoke in New Hampshire yesterday, and he spoke specifically on that, specifically addressing that. This is not a territorial dispute. Uh, and uh, that, that, to me, shows that there is a wide lane on that side, and that could politically help him as we continue uh, forward in the cycle. Uh, of course, Nikki Haley is also there. We, you know, Mike Pompeo, uh, who has not, uh, who's considering a run as well, could also be on that side of the ball. But it's, it is interesting how quickly Mike Pence jumped on it and, and how that he's utilizing already as a potential uh, 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 framework for a potential campaign. It is such a difficult thing to predict what, especially foreign policy issues, will end up in a presidential race. But we're going to have to leave it there for now. And that is Washington Week for tonight. Thanks so much to our panel for being here and sharing your reporting. And thanks to all of you for joining along with us. And be sure to watch PBS News Weekend, where John Yang looks at how Michigan might pass three new gun safety laws in the wake of the Michigan State mass shooting. I'm William Brangham. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week is provided by... For 25 years, Consumer Cellular has been offering no-contract wireless plans designed to help people do more of what they like. Our U.S.-based customer service team can help find a plan that fits you. To learn more, visit ConsumerCellular.tv. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan through the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. You're watching PBS.